Hello, my name is John Young. I'm the President and CEO of Columbus Regional Healthcare System. Beside me is Dr. Sam Wheatley. Dr. Wheatley is a long-term board member. He's a GYN surgeon, and most importantly for this conversation, he's the Chief Medical Officer of this organization. Today we're going to be answering some questions that we've heard from the community about the vaccine, the variant, and all the, all the different issues that are surrounding this COVID virus. For, in specific, we're going to talk about pregnancy and how that is affected. We're going to talk about reaction concerns. We're going to talk about how new is this vaccine, what does that mean. There are some breakthroughs. In other words, people who are vaccinated are getting the variant. We'll talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about just the fear of vaccines in general, our human immune system, and, and what about that in this equation, and concerns of the vaccine's long-term effect. And finally, who can we trust in these days and times? So let's get at it. Dr. Wheatley. John, I'd like to start by thanking you for inviting me to come and be with you today. Well, we appreciate it, and we're going to start in your wheelhouse. We're going to ta start talking about pregnancy <clears throat> and fertility concerns. Here is a question. I understand that if I'm pregnant, or if I'm considering getting pregnant, the COVID vaccine may be harmful to me, my ability to conceive, or even my unborn fetus. What are the facts around this question? Let, let's start with the fertility issue. Um, there is no evidence at this time that the vaccine inhibits fertility in any way. Uh, the real data about that are, are the first clinical patients that went through the clinical trials of Pfizer and Moderna, approximately 75,000 of those, 43,000 uh, with Pfizer, uh, about 35,000 with Moderna. Uh, as you remember, these, how the vaccine got the emergency use authorization. So in those trials, they were double blind, they were placebo. So half the patients got the vaccine, half the patients did not. To date, after over a year of those trials being completed, the pregnancy rate is the same in the vaccinated population of that group as it is in the placebo group. So there was no diminution of pregnancy in the vaccinated group. That has held up in the trial to this date. To date, uh, over the, over, in the world, over a million, uh, I mean, correction, a billion vaccines have been given, and there's no information that shows that it inhibits fertility uh, in any way whatsoever, male or female. The groups that are on board with that are the American Fertility Society, uh, American College OBGYN, uh, the societies of uh, endocrinology and infertility, uh, maternal fetal medicine group, CDC and FDA all agree that there are no fertility issues with these three vaccines. Okay, so. Well, that, that's, that's good news. <clears throat> what about, is it harmful to the mother or to the unborn baby? Um, you know, when the vaccines first came out uh, in December of last year, in January, uh, these, that same groups that I just mentioned all came out and said there was no contraindication of these vaccines in pregnancy. They all said that. Now that being said, within the last month, they have furthered that and highly recommended the vaccine in pregnant women. And the reason they have done that, uh, as a Delta variant became the dominant variant in the United States uh, since March, or especially in the last two months, many pregnant patients have contracted COVID-19. Uh, especially in the third trimester, these patients seem immunosuppressed, and it's like a comorbidity. It's like being older or having diabetes. And a lot of these patients, these pregnant patients who have contracted the virus, have not done well. They, 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 they have a threefold risk of going on a ventilator, going in an ICU, and succumbing to the virus over the group of pregnant women that are vaccinated or pregnant women that never contract the virus. So the recommendation has gone from, in the, like I said, in the, 
in the early part of the year from, it's not contraindicated that it's highly recommended that pregnant patients be vaccinated. The uh, vaccination of pregnant patients does confer immunity to the unborn child in the form of antibodies. The messenger RNA does not cross the placenta, just the antibodies against the virus. Anything else you want to talk about? This is really right in your wheelhouse. <clears throat> no, I mean, I think, you know, like I say, all the groups I mentioned are really promoting vaccination for pregnant women now because we see that pregnant women, especially in the third trimester who contract the virus, do not do well and are at risk uh, for becoming seriously ill becoming and succumbing to the virus. Okay, <clears throat> a second point of concern that we've heard from our community is a concern around reactions. For example, I have drug allergies. Should I be concerned about an allergic reaction? I'm on blood thinners, medication. Is there any concern that this will affect me negatively? What if I have a compromised immune system? Lots of those kind of questions around the reactions to the vaccine. Right. Well, let, let, let's do the uh, allergy thing first. Um, you know, there's a difference between allergy and side effects. Yes. Um, Side effects are, you know, you take the vaccine, uh, you might get soreness of the arm, you, you may get um, chills, you might even get some fever, they last one to three days. That's not an allergic reaction. An allergic reaction uh, is hives, swelling, lips, tongue, eyes, uh, wheezing. An anaphylactic reaction is when that goes so far as requiring an EpiPen or a visit to the emergency room. Um, the current recommendation by the CDC is that if you have allergies, significant allergies, but they do not involve an allergy to a previous vaccination uh, or another injectable, that you can safely take the vaccine. Okay. Now, that being said, we always monitor for allergic reactions. We watch patients 15 to 30 minutes, depending on their history with that. Um, <clears throat> the CDC recommends that if you do have an, a, a, an allergic reaction, anaphylactic reaction to the first vaccine, that you do not take the second one. Um, what we recommend with that, if you have that, is see your allergist, let that allergist go through which vaccine you got, um, the allergic reactions are not from the protein of the vaccine or the messenger RNA. The allergic reactions are to the envelope that the vaccine is packaged in, the messenger RNA. And th those are lipids. For Moderna and Pfizer, uh, that's a polyethylene glycol and a phosphocholine. Uh, for uh, uh, for um, J and J, that's polysorbate 80, uh, and and then with that information, and, th and those ingredients are are posted by the CDC. But with your allergist and that information, the allergist could help you determine if you could take another vaccine safely or not. Okay, so um, the instance of anaphylaxis is only about one patient per 10,000, wow. so it's it's not really very high. Um, any other questions about? So, a question about blood thinning medication. Okay, uh, they are not contraindications to, to that uh, at all. There's no data to say that they are. <clears throat> I think we all remember the only pause in vaccination in this country was with the J and J vaccine. At, at about 7.4 million doses were given, there was a handful of people that developed clotting disorder with that. They studied that data. It turned out that the incidence of that clotting disorder was about one in a million, and they determined that the benefit of the vaccine outweighed that, that side effect. And you know, that's the safety profile in any vaccination. The data is constantly changing, constantly being evaluated, and when side effects come up, they're, they're totally investigated and, and you know, and decisions made based on, on, on the outcomes of those investigations. But you really talk about something that's interesting to me, and that's the notion of the risk versus the return. 
that we're getting from this vaccine. Right. Can you speak to that just for a moment? Well, no vaccine's perfect, okay? Uh, there are some risks with all vaccines, as there always has been in history. But th the bottom line is, does the benefit of the vaccine outweigh the risk? And I think as we go further in the conversation, we'll see, you know, when you look at the numbers, you'll see that the benefits of the vaccination outweigh the small risks of the vaccination. So we do have some people in our community that have immune problems. They're compromised immune systems. Right. And they worry about this vaccine in that condition. Talk to us about that a little bit. Well, as opposed to that being a risk of the vaccine, it poses you at more risk for contracting COVID because your immune system is suppressed and your own immune system cannot right. fight, the, you know, fight the, the virus. What's happened in the last actually two weeks, the FDA has come out and said, we're going to give booster vaccine to immunosuppressed patients. That's patients who are kidney transplant patients, patients with HIV, patients who are on chemotherapy um, for cancer. Uh, they are eligible already for booster vaccination. And so being immunosuppressed makes the case for the vaccine being more important than ever. Got it. Okay. So I think the, uh, the next concern really comes about because from the general public's perspective, COVID hit us, and then before we knew it, there was a vaccine. So it's around, is the, are these vaccines too new to trust? I've got two questions here. Many sites on the internet say it takes 10 to 15 years to safety develop, safely develop a vaccine. How do we know what will happen to us 10 to 15 years after the injection? And another question, more general question, it seems like this vaccine was rushed to the market. Well, you know, you hear these questions all the time, and it's a great question. And I think part of the understanding of the question is to understand how these vaccines have been developed. These vaccines are not new. The development of these vaccines is not new. Uh, there's a lady who's going to win the, the Nobel Prize. Her name is uh, Catalina Kiriako and another gentleman named Drew Weitzman. They pioneered these vaccines. She came to America in 1985. She worked alone. Uh, he was doing the same research at the University of Pennsylvania. They both got kind of stymied with it, couldn't get too far. They worked together from 19, and they joined together in 98. In 98, from 98 to 2005, they published copious amounts of papers about messenger RNA vaccines. The NIH was already very deeply involved with this, loved the work, knew their work was groundbreaking and going to change the whole vaccine development picture. So in 2008, uh, Wall Street figured that out too. Moderna comes on the scene, development of messenger MRA vaccines. In biotech, a German company joined Pfizer. 2010, they partnered. So from 2010, the platform was already built and it was fine-tuned for 10 years with these messenger RNA vaccines. Uh, Zika virus, Ebola, a lot, of, a lot of work with flu, a lot of work with a lot of different viruses, CM, cytomegalic virus. Uh, a lot of these vaccines, they were working hard with this. Uh, they knew they had something, but the pandemic starting in, the, in this country in the March of 2020 yes. uh, changed everything. And it was a world pandemic, not seen since 1918. So then uh, President Trump uh, started Operation Warp Speed. Uh, he challenged the academic community the companies to all come together and develop a vaccine, messenger RNA vaccine. Uh, I think at the time when it started, uh, it, everybody thought it would take at least a year. Well, we know that it started actually the clinical trials, and these are the heroes of the, of the whole thing, the clinical trials. So 75,000 people stuck their arm out. They were from all over the world. Again, it was double-blind placebo study. Uh, 
But what made that happen is the government said, we will pay for the vaccine. We will buy millions and billions of doses and we will prepay you. So it took all the risk for the drug companies out. Pfizer was so confident they did not take any money on the front end. So that's how confident they were in the efficacy and safety of these vaccines. So in July of 2020, the study started. Uh, the clinical trials went all the way through. They were all evaluated by the FDA. And in December of 20, Pfizer got the go-ahead on emergency use authorization about the middle of the month. Moderna got it two weeks later. And then the vaccines began to roll out to the public. Uh, so in, in summary, the, tech, the, the technology of the vaccines uh, is 30 years in the making. Wow. What made it go so fast was the funding. The funding was fast. The funding typically is not fast. Uh, and the pandemic was the impetus for all that to change. So the, the other piece of this, the technology is much safer than the previous way we developed vaccines in the past. All the vaccines of the past pretty much attenuated viruses. Um, Egg, egg, egg in them, latex maybe, allergies. This vaccine is messenger RNA. There's no, uh, it's just safer. Um, and, and I think most people understand the, and we might get into that later, understand how the vaccine really works. It makes your own body make antibodies to the spike protein on the virus. And that disables the spike protein to enter the cell uh, and, and causes immunity. Amazing. Just amazing. So from your perspective, this is a long time coming, but it just got a jump start with pandemic and with funding. Yes. Yes. This, this technology to the level this has been in place 10 years, well understood. Both these individuals had patents on this technology. Moderna and Pfizer bought those patents and worked on it for 10 years to fine tune it. And they were ready. They just need somebody to hand, hand them a check. And that's what happened. Like I say, Pfizer was so confident in what they had, they didn't even take the money out front. That's very helpful, very helpful. So this next question I want to put into a little bit of perspective. We've been through two surges. The first surge was tough, but this surge, this Delta variant, seems to be more contagious and affecting more people in, in bigger ways than even the first surge. But part of the, what, what makes people pause and wonder about the vaccine is that even vaccinated people are getting this Delta variant. Right. So, you know, how, if, if they're getting the vaccine and they're getting the Delta variant, why do they need the vaccine? Okay. I and mean, again, probably the second most common question asked about this. Um, <clears throat> I think the first thing, let's go back to when the vaccines were developed. Everything was an alpha variant at that time, okay? And the vaccines were developed on the alpha variant, okay? Right. So you remember at that point that the effectiveness of the vaccine was about 95%, both for Moderna and, and for Pfizer. Right. Now, what does effectiveness mean? It means the ability of the vaccine to keep you from getting infected, okay? It, 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 that's, that's what that word means. So... Um, I think all of us remember, okay, there was a UK variant, there was a Brazilian variant, there was a, you know, and all of them have Greek letters, okay? Nobody can remember what Greek letters go with which ones, including me. But the Delta variant is remembered by everybody because the Delta variant came in India about the first of the year, okay? And you remember the news? India was oh, no oxygen. It, it just came and it went. It killed thousands and thousands of people. The Delta variant never came to the United States until March of 20, okay, of, of 21. 21. Of 21. So uh, the Delta variant first showed up about the last 10 days of March. By July, the Delta variant was 80% of the infections in the United States. And so this is when we found the breakthrough infections. We found the breakthrough infections uh, from 
the area of Provincetown, Massachusetts, where there were 423 patients that had been vaccinated totally. They either got two doses of Moderna or Pfizer or a dose of J&J, but they were COVID positive. Now, the important part of that, this whole thing, this study's really been studied well. Out of those 423 patients, only four of those patients were hospitalized and no deaths in those 423. So the takeaway message is the vaccinations will not keep you from getting the COVID-19 virus, but will keep you from getting seriously ill, hospitalized, and death. Uh, our own experience here is that 90, over 90% of our That's patients true. that are COVID positive here have not been vaccinated. Very few, and almost no patients here that have been completely vaccinated don't don't end up on ventilators and don't die. So that's why you need the vaccine. Um, it, it, you know, that's why the, the 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 breakthrough patients are so important. They get COVID, but they don't get seriously ill and they don't die. So one of the uh, questions we've heard a lot from the community is that they're, they've heard or they've read someplace or they know somebody that gives them concern about the long-term side effects of these vaccines. Uh, I, I think this is on people's minds and, and you have studied this. So what is your take on this question? Um, I, I think it's important to define what a long-term side effect it is. Number one, they're very rare in vaccines. Number two, they, they usually show themselves in about two months after vaccination trials. So to really get a perspective about this, let's go back and look at the vaccine history in the United States for the last 70 years, because that's when it started. Uh, you know, in the 50s, we were vaccinating against polio, smallpox. I remember that. Uh, measles, mumps, rubella. Uh, DTAP, and, and so most of the side effects of these vaccines were within the first two months of clinical trials because the FDA was keeping up with that. If you look back now over that vaccine history from 1950, 1960, 1970, there are no long-term side effects of those vaccines. And the vaccines now are even safer. So I think it's important to look at what history teaches us about vaccination and long-term side effects. You know, um, and, and I understand worrying about what's going to happen 20 years from now, but nothing happened 20 years from now from all those vaccines. And, you know, uh, I, I kind of like the analogy about the burning house. We all think about our house catches on fire. Get worried about the furniture. Most worried about the family pictures. Uh, but when the house catches on fire, what do we do? We get out of the house. Well, the house is on fire in America. We got people dying from this. And the vaccine is the solution. There have been a, a billion vaccines worldwide for these three vaccines. And, and there's not really any significant long-term effects that have been identified. The only one I've already mentioned is they stopped J they paused J and J at 7.4 million doses because they had a handful of people with clots. They evaluated that data and found that the the benefit of the vaccine outweighed that risk. Now that being said, instead of making you scared of J and J, that should make you think that the FDA is looking at these vaccines. They are looking at side effects. They will study a side effect. And, you know, if, if, if one of these vaccines does not pass muster, they will take that vaccine off the market. But that's not happened to date. And there's, there's been really nothing of that magnitude with either Moderna or, or, or the Pfizer vaccine. So this is a, maybe a moment for me to pause and talk, uh, ask you to talk about the impact on hospitals of this Delta virus is not really a question from the community, but the community does need to understand what's going on in healthcare across the country and healthcare in Columbus County. Well, you know, I, I think um, we kind of thought we had this thing controlled. Um, 
We did not make the vaccination quotas in July that the administration wanted to make. We kind of had a pause. You know, the J&J issue, I think, slowed it down a little bit, but there was a pause, and we didn't get to the numbers we really wanted to get to. Well, obviously, the Delta variant came into play in March, and by July, uh, 90% of the new cases were the Delta variant. And so... What's happened, if you look over the demographics of it, the counties in the United States that vaccinated below 30, 30 or 32 percent down, those, those counties have very high infection rates. That started in Missouri and Arkansas, spread to Texas, spread to Mississippi, Louisiana. Uh, it's, in, it's in Georgia, especially southeast Georgia, southeast North Carolina. So... Uh, areas that have vaccination rates in the low 30s, like I said, have extremely high case rates. For example, in Columbus County, which we have the highest case rate in the state, yes. but we have one of the lowest vaccination rates in the state. We're at 33 percent now. Uh, our case rate is over 1,400 cases per 100,000. So as vaccination rates are low, case rates go high. Well, what that does, that just people come to the ED, they have to be admitted if they're really sick, and it's just overwhelmed our system. 90% of the patients we admit are unvaccinated. The ones we admit that are vaccinated are not, are not very sick, but they're dehydrated, they got upper respiratory symptoms. We give them fluids, we may give them you know, some support. They're, they don't require high flow oxygen, they go home. But the patients that are unvaccinated, a majority of them get very sick. We have 29 of them on the, on the sixth floor right now, six in the unit, four on ventilators. All these patients basically are unvaccinated. So it, it's put a huge stress for emergency departments, critical care departments in, in the southeast United States. I mean, this is spread off from Texas to Florida. Florida and Texas are as bad as anybody. All the southeastern states ha ha have really issues with being overrun with this. Uh, the solution to that is vaccination. And masks. And masks. There's so many channels for people to look up things and find things and read things that it really becomes difficult to understand what the truth is or who you can trust. Here's a question, this goes right to the mass question. The CDC recommendations have been very inconsistent. A mask doesn't help at all to you mandate, you're mandated to wear a mask. All the changes in recommendations, mandates, effectiveness, etc., leaves you feeling you can't trust anything you hear. How do I know who to trust? Well, let, let's talk about the CDC recommendations on masks. Right. What happens is the recommendations are just a reaction to the reality of what's happening in the communities. So the mass restrictions kind of got lifted when we kind of got this under control. But when the Delta variant resurfaced in, in March and this got to be bad again, then the mass should come back because this Delta variant is 70% more transmissible than the Alpha variant was. Wow. Um, and, and that's called a row factor. The row factor is if one person's in a room with about 10 people, uh, how many people will that person infect? Uh, flu, um, c common cold, the row factor is two to three. Uh, chicken pox, it's about six. Measles, it's eight to nine. The Delta variant is, a, is between, is about eight. So, it's much more, and it's a contagious index. It's how contagious the virus is. So this virus is extremely contagious. So wearing the masks when many people are getting this virus makes sense. So the mandates change, uh, and, and I understand it's confusing for the public, and it, it, it looks like everybody's equivocating all the time, but the recommendations are just a response to what's going on in the communities. And so I think the CDC has been pretty spot on with, with these recommendations. Uh, who do you trust? It's more of a question of who you don't trust. 
Uh, there's more misinformation on the social media than, uh, than there is good information. I mean, it's just everywhere. A lot of it's, a lot of it's uh, just people misunderstanding. Some of it's very intentional. There's a guy in Florida, Dr. Merkula. Oh, let's call his name. He's out there. He's, he's, a, he's a master at manipulating social media. And he, he, you know, says the vaccine's this, 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 dangerous. But what he's doing, he's promoting products he sells that will cure the, that will cure the virus or keep you from getting the virus. That's just, it's wrong. But there's so much of that out there. And it's created so much confusion. So I, I still think you listen to, to the CDC. I think you listen to the FDA. I think, you know, yesterday they approved the vaccine. Uh, they, they didn't do that for almost, you know, it's been almost a year. They took their time. They made sure it's right. So you trust, I think you do trust the CDC and the FDA. Uh, you trust the experts. Uh, you trust Dr. Fauci. Um, and, and, you know, um, ask your doctor. And, and don't uh, stay off social. I mean, there's more misinformation on social media than I. It, it's, it's part of the problem. Who was the first doctor in this hospital to get vaccinated? Me. And I'll be the first That's one. That's who to, I trust. I'll be the first one to take the booster, too. I'll so I can't wait. I get it September 20th. So I, these are the questions that we've received. I think I really appreciate your expertise and your ability to explain complicated things to people who probably aren't trained in this, in this science. But let me just ask you to close with any remarks you would have for the residents and the population of Columbus County. John, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, I would like to end a little bit on a personal note. Um, number one, those who have been hesitant or resistant to taking the vaccine, uh, I don't believe in sh shaming anyone about their choice. I believe every American has a choice about this. I would say that all choices have consequences. And think about the consequences of this choice. Uh, it may affect you. It may affect uh, someone you love. It may affect somebody you don't even know. Um, the virus is our common enemy. It does not discriminate. It kills all of us. It, because we are all human beings. It kills all races. It does not discriminate. It kills all genders. It kills Democrats and Republicans. Uh, so we, we don't need to fight among ourselves about this. We need to unite. We need to shred the spread and get vaccinated. The vaccine is the solution to this issue. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I have read everything I can about this vaccine. I'm no expert by any means. There are many people that know much more than I do about it. But it is safe and it is effective. Uh, I would have not been the first to take it if I didn't believe that. I would have not recommended it to my children or my grandchildren. And I have recommended it to all of them. Uh, I ask you and plead with you, reconsider if you haven't done it and let's shred the spread, take the shot, get vaccinated. Thank you very much, Dr. Wheatley.